recommend this to every person I meet who's a pre-med. When you're doing your clinicals, whether it be through being an EMT or a medical assistant, however you do it, take notes of things that really stand out to you, good and bad. Write down the stories of things that you encounter that really change the way you think about the world or about healthcare, because not only will that be helpful for you as you continue in your studies, but it's also really helpful for when you're writing your application. You have good stories to share and you have a genuine, meaningful and unique story. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me for this, the 583rd episode of Admission Straight Talk. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accept as med school admissions quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash med quiz. Again, that's accepted.com slash med quiz. Complete the quiz and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take the quiz at accepted.com slash med quiz to obtain your free assessment. Our guest today, Yael Brook, recently graduated from Binghamton University, earning the university's highest award, the Chancellor Award for Student Excellence. At Binghamton, she double majored in biological sciences and philosophy and was on the pre-medical track. Beyond the bare bones background, I'm going to let Yael tell her story. Yael, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Pleasure to have you. Now, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you grew up, et cetera? Sure. So I actually grew up in postal Iowa, where we didn't have oh, such wow. great access to um, medicine or education. So my family finally moved to the East Coast when I was in middle school. I was very far behind my peers and found myself really struggling in school, but wanting to learn more and wanting to do well in school. So I pushed myself really hard. And thankfully, I was able to catch up to my peers. And by the time I was in high school, I was excelling in school, loved learning. And then in college, I just decided that I really liked the sciences and then I wanted to explore different career paths that are offered by the sciences. So I did a lot of research. I shadowed doctors and midwives and nurses, PAs, until I found like what really struck me as what I want to do. And I found that I loved the role that doctors play in the healthcare team. So that's the path that I chose to follow. Great. What were some of the things you did as you were exploring? Um, so I worked in a lab doing cancer research. So we okay. would actually do specialized research for each individual patient's unique situation with cancer that they had. And I loved that experience. I thought it was so meaningful that we really pay attention to the unique story of each person. But I found myself more interested in the story of the person and in the personality, I guess, of the sample that we got. And I felt so far removed from the person that we were helping that I found that maybe a clinical setting would be better. So okay. then during COVID is when I started doing COVID testing and getting more into clinical type of work. So it sounds like your exploration actually probably started either at the very beginning of college or even before college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So you really enjoyed the clinical and now as, as COVID moved off center stage, let's put it that way, as, as clinical opportunities opened up and, you know, it went beyond, I assume, COVID vaccine clinics, right? So how else did you, you, you explored PA, you explored nursing, you explored obviously becoming a physician. What else did you do? I did COVID testing for the healthcare clinic that I was in. I also did uh, COVID testing on campus. And then once COVID died down a little bit, I was able to switch to do any department I wanted. And usually people just pick a department and stick there because it's easier to do that than having to train all the time. But I found that I was there not just to work. I was there to find what I wanted to do with my life. So I started shadowing and working in all different departments from podiatry to cardiology, endocrinology, ENP, acute care. I did some specialties like maternal fetal medicine, 
Um, I did rheumatology and I found that there were some that I really enjoyed and some that I really did not like. <laughs> and in each department, I really tried to talk to all the nurses there to talk to the different kinds of providers that were there to get their story and what they liked and disliked about their own careers. Wow. Okay. Sounds like you went at it very purposefully and that was a great idea. Did you do any journaling? I'm just curious as you were, as you were exploring, did you take notes? For sure. And I recommend this to every person I meet who's a pre-med. When you're doing your clinicals, whether it be through being an EMT or a medical assistant, however you do it, take notes of things that really stand out to you, good and bad. Write down the stories of things that you encounter that really change the way you think about the world or about healthcare. Because not only will that be helpful for you as you continue in your studies, but it's also really helpful for when you're writing your application. You have good stories to share and you have a genuine meaningful and unique story. I'm applauding here. <laughs> I'm applauding. That is so important. And it'll, it'll so help the applicant when they actually get to the primary and secondary applications. It just, it's just, uh, you'll have this treasure chest of stories that you can draw from with yeah, your 100%. initial reactions to it and the enthusiasm, whether positive or negative towards whatever, however that experience changed you and affected you. For sure. Yeah. Now, you majored in biology and philosophy. Why? It's not the typical combination. Yeah. Um, originally, I wanted to go into college just majoring in philosophy because while I really enjoyed the sciences, I found that I would probably do grad school, like either a PhD or medical school or some other kind of healthcare job. So I knew eventually I'll learn the sciences, but I knew I was never going to go to school for philosophy for like a higher degree. So I really wanted to challenge myself to think critically and deeply about everything to become a better writer and to really think about medical ethics and research ethics. So I found that doing a philosophy degree really helped me with all of those things and more. And then as I was doing my pre-med requirements, I realized I only needed a few more to get a biology degree. So that's just why I added that one. <laughs> <laughs> so really the philosophy came first, the bio came second. Got I it. Thought maybe I'll minor in biology because like the minor was pretty much covered by the pre-med requirements. But then like, as I was doing it, I was like, okay, <laughs> I should just add it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I just want to go back to what we were talking about before in terms of your clinical, because I meant uh, the question occurred to me. I didn't ask it. Do you have a specific direction that you think you'd like to pursue? Obviously you're going to be learning a lot before you have to focus, but any, any direction. At this point. Yeah. So I guess when I was like shadowing and working in different departments, one of the things that I wanted to figure out was which direction I wanted to go in. I found that I really, really loved OBGYN. I just love how I can help people in such a vulnerable position who are willing to be helped and who are willing to listen to you and are willing to help themselves also. That's something that I didn't find in other departments. I also really liked pediatric cardiology. So hmm. See, I'm open to just trying everything, but having those two in the back of my mind is like, those are really fun and interesting. We should like keep those there. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay. Now you've decided to go straight from undergrad to medical school. A, that's difficult. B, it's somewhat counter to the trend that I've seen in medical schools, not just me. I mean, I was talking to one medical admissions director and he talked how I think in the last 10 years, the average age of medical students has gone up two years of, for matriculants. So any particular reason you, you're just ready to go? Or obviously you started your exploration really early on. That probably helped too. But did you know all along that you were going to go straight? Or did you decide that just as kind of like you added the bio, bio major, you're ready, you might as well do it? To be honest, I didn't really think of it much as a decision. I thought I'll apply this cycle if like many others, I don't get accepted this cycle, I'll take a gap year. And mm -hmm. I'll learn from the past cycle, figure out what I need to fix so that if I have to take a gap year, it's only one because I didn't really want to take two gap years or more. Right. So I figured I'll leave it up to them. I feel ready. But if they feel that I'm not ready, I'll take a gap year. And that's fine. Like I would find a job or some research to do. Taking a gap year really is an incredible opportunity. And if someone feels like they need the break, I think it's very important to take it, but I felt like I didn't need the break. And I also wanted the experience of applying and getting insight on my application before, you know, taking a gap year and redoing the application. Okay, great. 
Now you mentioned that you did uh, the the COVID vaccine clinics. Were there other ways in which COVID affected your med school plans? Especially since you know you started college in 2020, that was the height of COVID, and it was hard to get clinical exposure. It was hard to do almost anything. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I didn't do COVID vaccines because as an MA, I wasn't allowed to do vaccines. I just did COVID testing. Okay. I think it affected my plans for medicine by giving me the ability to have exposure to healthcare and clinical hours while everything was shut down. It also gave me the opportunity to give back to my community to like be able to help out the healthcare center that's near my house when they were so understaffed because everyone was getting COVID. I was able to come in and say, hey, I'm on break right now for a few days or for winter break. I can come in 12 hours a day, go home and my mom will make me dinner. Like I have nothing on my plate. I'm happy to like come in and do as many hours as you need. If I get COVID, I'll stay home for the next like week or however long it was at that point in time. It also affected things kind of negatively, I think. Starting off my freshman year, fully online was really hard. I was doing research, so I got to go in person for that. But my classes being online was really difficult because I just didn't really have a good support system going into college. Being a first generation American, my parents couldn't really help me. So I had no idea what I was doing and no one to help me because I wasn't meeting people in my classes by sitting next to them. I wasn't meeting my professors. I didn't even think my professors were approachable. So I think that really affected my confidence myself in my freshman year. But then once I got to sophomore year, junior year, and things were in person, and I got to meet people and meet my professors and make good connections and find a support system, I found that my confidence grew a lot more and I felt much more able to tackle the medical school route. Did your grades take a hit in the freshman year? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's not <laughs> uncommon, you know, it's very common. Now your LinkedIn profile, despite COVID <laughs> that first year, shows that you were involved in advocacy. You volunteered in a food pantry. You did some graphic design work and you also worked as a medical assistant when, when possible, which is probably what we were just discussing. And despite it all, you were very, very busy. Now, admittedly, your mom couldn't make you dinner, but you were still very busy. You also managed to earn a GPA and MCAT score that somehow allowed you to get accepted to multiple programs. How did you manage the juggling? Yeah, honestly, I really like that question because when I decided I wanted to do pre-med, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to juggle all these things. I need hundreds of hours and community service, research, leadership, volunteering, clinical hours, like it seems unapproachable, but I realized no one has more time than anyone else. Everyone's given the same 24 hours in a day and you can choose what you want to do with them. So like for the weekends, I could choose to sleep and to rest, or I could choose to go work in a food pantry for just a few hours really. And If you just do a few hours every weekend over, let's say, two years, you'll have hundreds of hours by the end. So it's more of like playing the long game and trying to get few hours every break you have than trying to do hundreds of hours in a semester and burn yourself out. And damage your GPA. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also, I guess, figured out that the semester, like during the semester time, I have to focus on my GPA and research. And I guess like also leadership positions. And then during breaks would be when I focus on volunteering and community service. So that, and clinical hours, of course. Um, So that things were much more balanced and I was able to tell myself, okay, during this break, I'm not getting any research done, but that's okay. Cause I'm getting clinical hours done. I'll get research done during the semester. So breaking things up like that also allows yourself to just be kinder to yourself about how you're using your time and know that you're covered. You got yourself right. covered. <laughs> also allows you to focus. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Right. Different, different times, different things. And exactly. like you said, if you felt you needed to do a gap year, you would have done a gap year. For sure. Okay. What was the hardest part of the application process for you? I think trying to figure out how to tell my story was very hard. I have a lot of aspects of my life that I think are interesting or that I think are boring, but other people find interesting. (laughs) Your LinkedIn profile, I can tell you, is very interesting. Thank you. (laughs) But for me, it seems like 
I'm sure to everyone, your life seems so normal to you. It seems so average, but so it was hard to find, okay, which parts of my story are unique? How did they translate into my journey to healthcare? And how do I put that down on paper in a way that's interesting? So I found that to be really challenging. And how did you handle the challenge? Accepted really helped me out with that. Okay. And, um, yeah, it was <laughs> mostly you guys, <laughs> but it was also just talking to um, friends and asking them, hey, if you were to describe my life and only the interesting events that you know about, like, how would you describe it? And just seeing, varied. Like, uh, <laughs> just seeing, like what their brains like hold on to and stick to from the story of my life shows, OK, these are the meaningful, interesting things that are unique that will stick with an admissions committee member who's reading the essay. All right. Partially answered this question, but what were some of the activities that your friends said or that your consultant that accepted said you should, you should focus on? And, and do you know how they determined that? What was the reasoning they gave? I'm sure you didn't just blindly say, okay, you said, I should do this. I should do this. You probably said, well, why did you choose that? So what were some of the things that, that you found consistently coming up? That's a good question. I think it's interesting because a lot of the things that consistently came up were things that I consistently thought were boring. <laughs> so <laughs> things like speaking a few languages or being the daughter of immigrants or coming from a low educational background or even talking about Iowa to me is so boring compared to New York, <laughs> but other people are interested in hearing about it. And um, I guess my husband went to school in Iowa, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So funny. He went to Iowa University, University of Iowa. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I think those aspects of my application were like almost normal to me and boring, but other people <laughs> helped me realize like how meaningful they truly are. Okay. How many schools did you end up applying to? I applied to 31 schools. <laughs> All right. That's not so unusual. And yeah. uh, how many secondaries did you end up submitting? All 31. All 31. And how did you stay on top of the secondaries? Because again, they usually come all at once. By the time the show airs, a lot of people are going to be drowning in secondaries. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So I actually kept a Google sheet of all the dates. So I put in like primary application submitted, application verified, and then date secondary received. And I put that for every single school. And then the next column was due by. So then I put down the date of two weeks from the day that my secondary was submitted. And then the next received column, secondary or, was received, right? Two days from the date your secondary was received, two weeks right? From exactly the secondary yeah. was received. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And then the next column was the secondary status or submission date, meaning it's in progress, didn't start yet, forming ideas, just writing notes to myself about like what the secondary looks like, how bad we're looking, how good it's going. <laughs> um, and then the next column was actually very helpful. I wrote questions to use later. So questions that are going to come up again and again. For example, why medicine? Um, tell us about what you did during COVID. What's your proudest accomplishment? Describe yourself. Why us? What support did you have? All these questions come up again and again. So I had in a column, hey, this school asked this. I just wrote a good essay about COVID. Reuse this one. Don't write another COVID one. And then I just sorted the sheet by the due by date so that I would go from the one that's closest to being due to the one that I have more time for. And I would just go through and do the best that I can to answer the questions. And just know to yourself that the outcomes care a lot about secondaries, but they care even more about primaries. So of course your personal statement is gonna be much better than your secondary essay. And that's fine. That is how it's gonna be. You have two weeks to write the secondary. You have months to write your primary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right. I think you gave some great suggestions in terms of the, of the secondary. And did you ever copy and paste essays from one school to the other, or did you always tweak them and adapt them? Or did you usually tweak them and adapt them? Always might be too strong. Mm. I think it's kind of hard, unfortunately, to copy paste because every school has different word counts or character counts. But there were some sentences that I think I used in every single school. Like, I think what was really helpful with the questions to use later is even if the next school, let's say, that asks about COVID gives you significantly fewer characters, at least you have an idea to work off of. You have sentences you can borrow. Right. So 
I would say, yeah, I recommend copy pasting. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> Well, uh, I would say copy and pasting sentences is fine. I wouldn't copy sure. and paste a whole essay because, as you say, the character counts are different. Sometimes exactly, the focus yeah. of a question can be a little bit different. And um, yeah. since the schools all ask different questions and you want to minimize duplication, that's why I asked about adapting. And using sure. sentences yeah. means you're adapting yeah, in my book. That's so, Makes okay. Sense, yeah. All sure. right. How many schools did you interview at? I interviewed at four schools. Okay. Yeah. And how did you prepare for your interviews? One of the biggest tips that I got for preparing was to go on the student doctor network page for a school's interviews. Mm -hmm. And there you will find just lists and lists of the questions that the school asks. And nine times out of 10, it was all picked from those lists. Like I was thankfully never surprised in an interview by questions they asked me, unless they're more personal questions, in which case it shouldn't really be surprising anyway. <laughs> but yeah, that was so, so helpful. And then just looking through those questions, being able to answer them, but not have like a robotic answer to them. Don't write yourself a script, just have something in mind and say it straight yeah. out clearly. And then also while you're on that student doctor network page, check how comfortable people felt during the interview, because chances are they felt really comfortable. That's what I experienced in looking at the SDN pages of all the schools I applied to and knowing that I'm going to walk into it in a conversational manner and knowing that it's going to be professional, but easy is a really nice thing to know going in. That's great. Great advice. Anything you would do differently in terms of your application process? Good question. I think I would, and I don't know how, to do this. So if I figure it out one day, I'll do that. <laughs> I think I would try to be a little bit less worried. I put out my story and if they don't like it, that's fine. But if they do, they'll reach out to me when it's time for them to reach out to me. They'll get to my application when they get to it. It doesn't matter if they got to everyone else's applications first, because they'll get to you when they get to you. And I remember every time I got a notification on my phone, even if it was an email, I would jump because I was like, oh my gosh, what if it's an interview invite? What if it's another rejection? And just to be able to tell myself like, whatever will happen will happen, whether it's today, in an hour, tomorrow, it's fine if you get an email and miss it for a day, nothing's gonna happen. So to just be a little bit more relaxed about the process, and know that you put your best foot forward and it's time to just show yourself off to the admissions committees. Right, right. Sounds good. That sounds like mm -hmm. very good advice. Yeah, I mean, uh, pre-meds tend to be a highly stressed group. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, they go, sure. if they go at it <laughs> with the confidence of, okay, I did my best and I'll just let it play out. Exactly, yeah. Right. Okay, good advice. What are your plans for between now? Well, first of all, I didn't, we didn't, haven't, I haven't asked the question. You said you were interviewed at four schools. We know you're going to medical school, but how many schools were you accepted at? And did you apply both MD and DO or just MD or what? Yeah. So I applied to MD and DO. I applied to six DO schools. I was accepted at three schools and waitlisted on one. I ended up withdrawing from that waitlist. So who knows? You were accepted. Do you mind saying where you're accepted or? Oh, um sure so i was first accepted at buffalo uh -huh. upstate new york uh -huh. i didn't really like i mean i loved the school it was gorgeous but i didn't really like the location it was in the middle of nowhere but gorgeous okay. school very cheap to near work. niagara <laughs> yes exactly it was so nice um and then i was accepted at Turocom in harlem which had a much better location but i found that what i wanted from a school didn't really align with Turo, and i didn't know how safe i would feel being in harlem so I was kind of balancing those two. And then I was also accepted at Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson, which I fell in love with automatically. And I think they could really see how intensely happy I was with what the school has to offer during my interviews and in my secondaries. So I think that's what sold it. And then I was waitlisted at NYTCOM. Wonderful. Okay, great. Congratulations. Uh, what you. are your plans for between now and the start of medical school? Mostly just relaxing, taking it easy, trying to take a deep breath and figure out, you know, what works best for me when I'm trying to do self care or to take a break from studying, take a break from working. I haven't really taken a break in like four years. <laughs> so it's really good to take a break and to 
figure out for myself what I really enjoy doing when I'm taking a break, like cooking or crocheting or painting. Um, so I want to do that. I'm also planning to travel a little bit, mostly just chill. <laughs> Sounds good. Then you deserve it. Yeah. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> any last bits of advice for pre-med? I mean, what would you, you mentioned being a little less stressed. That's, you know, kind of done my best, but like, we didn't touch on the MCAT at all. Were you satisfied with your MCAT score? Was it a problem? Um, again, you were juggling a lot. Yeah, I actually, for the MCAT score, I was actually really unhappy with my score. I thought that I would have to take a gap year because of it. Oh, wow. I was told that it was not a strong score, but I felt that I had a strong story to tell. I had a strong GPA. I have a good reason why my MCAT isn't good as many, many people fairly do. It's a really hard exam and if you don't have all the free time and money in the world. You're, it's going to be very, very challenging. So I found myself thinking about when I should start studying for the MCAT again. And if I were to retake it, when I would retake it so that I can reapply. And so I had that calendar always in the back of my mind. And I knew if I didn't get accepted this cycle, that would be my calendar. And Unfortunately, I really did have to start studying before I heard back from schools, because if I wanted to take it by the time the next cycle were to start, I'd have to take it early. Thankfully, I did hear back. I got accepted, as I said, to Buffalo first. So once that came through, I was like, okay, I'm not taking Done. the MCAT again. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's but great. It was nice to see from Buffalo, at least at first, that your MCAT score matters, but if you have a passion and a story that can come through and good grades and good clinical hours research, you can really make up for it. Good to hear. Oh, one other question. Did, do you mind sharing the, you said that accepted was helpful to you in the application process. Which consultant did you work with? Do you mind my asking? Sure. I worked with Barry. He was <laughs> awesome. Really incredibly amazing. Like he, I don't know how he did it, I would tell him my story and he would just make it sound interesting to me as if he was there <laughs> more than I was. <laughs> I found when I was uh, more actively involved in consulting that I remember many times I'd be talking to clients and they would basically say, yeah, that, that's not so interesting. And I say, what are you talking about? <laughs> No, exactly. you, know, you, like, you, you have this thread area? running through your experiences. It ties them together. Exactly. Um, and it was yeah. a, I, you know, I remember there was one guy, this was when we were working in person, which ended very quickly or very early in the business. And the guy was practically running out of the house. I worked at home, running out of the house. He was so wanted to go write his essay because <laughs> now <laughs> he knew what he wanted to say. He had a story to tell. Exactly. It really is. And I can imagine kind of Barry would do that very well. For sure. For sure. And it, it was honestly nice, even personally, to be able to tell my story in a new way that wasn't even boring to me, like not even for the application cycle, just for myself. It was really nice to have that experience. Right. And I'm sure it also kind of increased your confidence and, you know, reduced the nerves and all that good stuff. For sure. No question. <laughs> All right. What do you wish I would have asked you or any last bits of wisdom for medical school applicants? Either one, both, sure. whatever. I guess I could kind of combine both into one answer. Okay. Um, I think a good question to ask people who are accepted at med school, if you're applying right now, is asking them what interview questions threw you off. Because oh, that's a great question. <laughs> Even though you can read the Student Doctor Network reviews and questions, sometimes you'll just get a question that you're like, wow, you made this up today to stump me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when that happens, it's important that you know that the person interviewing you knows that it's a hard question. So if you just start babbling because you have nothing to say, they know. So take a moment, say, wow, that was a really good question. And just take a moment to think about it, to show that even if you do have an answer that immediately pops into your mind, think about it for a moment. Give yourself a minute to say, I'm stumped. That's okay. Let's think about it. Think about a good story to tell, a good experience that you have that relates to it, what you learned from it. So I'll give an example. One of the schools asked me what the most challenging paper I had to write in undergrad was. And I know if I had only done my biology degree and not philosophy, I would have been stumped. I don't know. Maybe I took a writing class in freshman year and had to write about something, 
there's nothing interesting. But you can think about some unique thing about yourself or the process. So you could talk about a research paper that you did, or I talked about the philosophy paper that I wrote for my honors thesis. And they really liked that. They liked that I had an example of something that wasn't just, you know, kind of, I had to be in a writing class and I had to write a paper about this. I didn't write anything else in college. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great, uh, I think that the key piece of advice is if you have a question and, and this is, by the way, I think in any situation and you're not sure of the answer or you, you want to just say, mm, let me think about that for a second. That's okay. Exactly. It's a hundred percent. Okay. In an interview, yeah, yeah. certainly. Okay. Medical school interview, any kind of interview, you can say, let me think about that for a second. And then yeah, think I mean, about it for a second. Right. <laughs> and it shows the interviewer like a genuine interest of yours in answering their question and in thinking about it and contemplating it, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Wonderful advice. Yeah, Elle, I think we're running out of time. You've been very kind, very generous, and you've given some wonderful insights into the medical school application process. Thank you so much for joining me. And thanks for sharing your experience and perspective. Where can yeah, listeners awesome. learn more about you if they want to contact or reach you out to you if they want to contact you? They can reach me on my LinkedIn. Okay. So we're going to link from the show notes at accepted.com slash 583 to Yael's LinkedIn page. We'll also link to Barry Rothman's bio page if you want to reach out to him and as well as to other related podcasts and resources. Listener, thank you too for tuning in to this, our 583rd episode. If you found this show worthwhile, please make sure you don't miss any others. Subscribe through your favorite podcatcher. We have subscribe links in the show notes at accepted.com slash 583. And a last reminder, take the med school admissions quiz. See if you're really ready to apply and learn what you need to do to improve your chances of acceptance. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash med quiz today. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 